Let's go back to the book of John, the fourth chapter. There at day 43rd down to the 54th verse, it's one of the greatest lessons of the gospel is presented in this scene from the ministry of Christ. And uh, it's a lesson that it's it's simple, but it's yet so critical. And it is the evidence of faith. And uh, from the very beginning of our relationship with God, genuine faith has evidence. Aren't you glad about that? And that evidence was displayed by these Galileans. So let's look here at the 43rd verse to the 45th verses first. This is the evidence and stages of faith. The evidence and stages of faith. Verse 43. Now after the two days he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So let's look at these three verses where it kind of lays out the picture of the evidence of faith. Apparently, Jesus had detected in Judea, his own country, the increasing hostility of the religious leaders, though the real opposition would not yet appear for some months. Christ was really never identified with Judea, even though he had been born in Bethlehem. He was known as the prophet from Galilee. Jesus knew that the public response to his ministry in Jerusalem had been, it had been insincere and it had been shallow and that it was not honoring to him at all. So in this chapter, we are seeing in the lives of individuals. We saw it last week in the life of the Samaritan woman. And we have seen it in the disciples and in these individuals. And we'll even see it here, how their faith began. There's always got to be a beginning to your faith. How it grew. Your faith is always meant to grow. It's growing now, and it should be able to grow until we draw our last breath. The word says, faith cometh by hearing. It always is coming. Faith cometh, faith cometh. It's always available to be able to come to us, to do in us what needs to be done so that Jesus can get the glory and the honor out of our lives. So how it grew and what it did for them, and your faith is not only designed to do something for us individually, but it's designed to do something for others, that when others catch hold and look at our lives and see the change that Christ has brought in us and through us, that we don't act like we used to act, and we don't talk the way we used to talk, there's a difference, something is seen about the way we conduct ourselves, our character, and how, I, how we carry our 
ourselves. And so as a result, others see what has gone on in your life and know that there must be a hope that lieth within you that they don't have. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. So the first step here is the settings. Jesus entered into Galilee. It's what that's 23 verse 6. And after spending two days with the Samaritans, he entered there and he had experienced great success in his brief ministry there in Samaria. Many had believed him. However, Galilee was the area. and hostility toward him often preyed upon his mind. This is what the book of Mark tells us. So Jesus' statement served to prepare the disciples for persecution. They were to be severely persecuted by their fellow countrymen. And he discussed this fact again and again to drive it into their minds. So often we think that all folks don't love us when we become a preacher, we become a pastor, a pastor, a this, this, they're going to hate you the more. <laughs> there ain't no need of you thinking you're going to get a whole bunch of honor and praise and look, they're going to run your name through the mud, stamp on it, and yet when they see you, they'll smile in your face. Oh, we love you so much. <laughs> but oh my God, when you know God for yourself, you just go ahead and smile back at him and tell him God loves you and so do I and keep on moving. Somebody shout hallelujah. So Jesus is due honor. He is due all the honor and the glory in the universe. He is the Son of God who brought God's presence to the people of the world. He is the Savior of the world who came to save us from perishing and made it possible for us to live forever. Aren't you glad that you've got eternal life right now? Right now, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
when you draw your last breath and step out of this ungodly world, you're going to step into the presence of the King of Kings. Oh, hallelujah to his name. So he is the Son of Man who came to earth to experience all the trouble that he might heal and be touched by our infirmities and thereby become qualified to help us in all of our suffering. And people who believe in Jesus honor him. Honoring Jesus is a clear evidence of faith. Honor means to value, to esteem, to respect. And first, it conveys the idea of superior standing, exaltation, reverence. Where it says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And second, there's the idea of a price paid or received, of counting something of value. And then thirdly, the idea of righteousness is expressed. Paul said, I suffered the loss of all things and count them as dumb in order that I might gain Christ. Isn't that what you and I try to have to gain in Christ? My God, the more you learn of him, the more you know of him, the more he uh, reveals himself to you in your inner man, in your inner heart, the more you come to love him and to serve him and to worship him. So people who do not believe in Jesus do not honor him. And it's particularly seen in the dishonor of Jesus by his fellow citizens and the unbelievers. Unbelievers do not give Christ the worship, the exaltation, or reverence to his name. The unbelievers do not pay the price of surrendering their life to Christ as Lord. And the word says, for this people's heart has grown dull. Oh, my God, I, I trust that the pandemic has not made your spirit dull. Oh, my God, it has happened. It has happened to many of you. That's why you've got to have a press in your spirit. You've got to have a press in your soul that when you feel the dullness of life trying to get in and give you a dull praise and a dull worship and dull joy, you know, it's take it off of you. Say, get behind me, Satan. I'm going to give God the glory. I'm going to give him the praise. Hallelujah. No matter what it looks like, I'm going to lift up my hands and magnify him and praise him and exalt him and glorify him. Oh, hallelujah. And then that second evidence, the evidence of faith, is welcoming and receiving Jesus. The second evidence that is welcoming and receiving him. The only way to be saved and to receive the benefits of Jesus' presence is to welcome and receive him. Common sense tells us that a person who does not have the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't have the blessings of Almighty God. Oh, my God. That's why you want to receive him with everything that is within you. First, they had heard the Lord preach and had seen his marvelous works in Jerusalem, and the citizens of Jerusalem had been Jesus focused there not the Galileans. So people can never be led to believe in Christ until they are receptive to Christ. Oh, in other words, they must be willing to listen to the message of Christ. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and blessed are your ears, for they hear. Aren't you glad to have a hearing ear? It's good to be born again, for, and you grow in your faith because you get a hearing ear. Not just to hear naturally, but you hear things of the Spirit that the Lord is trying to speak to you to draw you into a place of faith and increase and abundance and favor with Him. That's how you learn of the Lord 
Jesus. So that's what this, that's what church ought to be about. It ought to be a place where you are growing from step to step, from level to level. Every step, of everything you hear, ought to be able to push you into another place in the spirit of God, in the realm of God, where you come to trust Him more. Because life will throw you things, and everything that life throws you, that the enemy throws you, you have to work your way into a place of faith and get out of the natural mind of I can't do it, I can't make it, I don't know how, I don't know where, I don't know which, but when you know him for your Hallelujah. When you know him for yourself, faith pushes you into another level. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know you're God Almighty. God, I don't know when it's coming, when the door is going to be open, how it's going to happen, but step by step. I'm leaning on you. I'm looking to you. I'm depending on you. My eyes are on you. Look over and tell somebody, keep your eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him. <laughs> Okay, sit that down. I got, a, I got a little ways to go. Here. Got a little ways to go. So the Galileans had welcomed and received Christ, welcoming and receiving, and experiencing Christ for oneself is the greatest evidence of genuine faith. Always be welcoming. You can walk. You, you see, you see who are home every day. You can walk around the house and Father, I thank you. I worship you. Come in, come in, because you're welcome, Holy Spirit. You're welcome to speak to me. You're welcome to show me things in the Spirit. I can't, I'd like to get out and do what I need to do, but Lord, you can show it to me in the Spirit so that I can begin praying for it. I can begin in a pleading for it. Oh, if we would only know that there's no distance in prayer. There's no distance in prayer. You can step down the devil's path right in your home. Right in your kitchen while you're washing dishes. Right in your laundry room when you're washing clothes. You can sit down the devil's work. If you would call on him and look to him and depend upon him, the spirit of prayer can come on you. But not be able to get out the way you'd like to get out, but right where you are, you can make it a sanctuary. Let the soul be a sanctuary. Let the inner man be a sanctuary for the Spirit of God to dwell in, and He'll speak to you. He'll bring things to your mind. He'll bring things to your spirit. Call and pray for this one. Call out their names before the Lord. This one needs a miracle. This one needs a touch. This one needs an answer to prayer. This one is in trouble. This one is on the brink of suicide. This one is on the brink of shutting down and never doing nothing. God, that's your best to be able to make you an inner Look where you are. Go up your hands and ask the Lord for the spirit of prayer to fall on you. Ah, oh, the spirit of prayer, the spirit of prayer. Oh, my God, hallelujah. You want anybody to do anything for you nowadays, just let them pray for you. Tell people all the time, when you think of me, call my name out in prayer. And I don't even tell them what to pray for, because I know if they just call my name out, the Spirit of the Lord knows how to interpret a prayer. <laughs> you ain't going to 
tell everybody your fellow problems and your trials and your tests and your just say when you when you call when you call on God, remember me. And the spirit of the Lord can interpret when they see your name, they'll know. Hey, glory be to God. What you need and what you're standing in the need of. Somebody said, Hallelujah. All right, let's go there to the 46th verse. The 46th verse. 46. Now, 46th verse. So Jesus came to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Cana. All right, here we are beginning to enter into the stages of faith. And within it, there are some steps to the stages of faith. Many people do not truly understand what biblical faith is. They think it's something we feel, mere emotion. But genuine faith is far more than a feeling. If you're looking for a feeling, you're going to be in trouble. Because a cheesecake will take all your feelings away. <laughs> Eating that cheesecake at midnight going to do some other stuff to your head. <laughs> you're trying to lay down and go to sleep and you know, got that cheesecake laid up in your chest. So you can't be looking for a feeling. <laughs> you need to go take some antacids or something so you can get a good night's sleep. You can be messed up when it comes to the things of the spirit if you are looking for a natural feeling. Somebody say amen. True faith compels you to act. To do something to obey the Lord. And Scripture states unequivocally that faith without work is good. Oh, you know it. And this passage in John's Gospel tells us the story of a man who illustrates this faith, genuine faith, the type of faith, this type of faith, genuine faith. Commits no deception, no charlatan, no bother. It's a genuine and sincere faith that flows from a true heart with the desire to do what is right. So, this story illustrates how faith grows in the human heart. None of us are born into God's family with our faith fully developed. We all go through the various stages to arrive where God wants us to be. So this passage reveals to us several stages of faith. And uh, let's take a look to see how faith grows in the midst of very desperate circumstances. So here in this verse 46, that first stage of faith is a beginning faith. When Jesus entered the city of Cana, an official or nobleman, a high-ranking officer of the king's royal court, approached Jesus. And this man's actions demonstrated exactly what is involved in a beginning faith. The first thing we see is, in this 46th verse, the royal official had a desperate need. His son was gravely ill and at the point of death. Needs, listen, needs are going to come to 
Every one of us. Every human being, eventually the severe needs arising from some illness, some accident, some disease, some suffering, some death, comes everybody. No one is exempt. You just keep on living and minding your own business. And stuff will cross your path that you ain't had nothing to do with. And suddenly you can find yourself in a place where you've got to call on God. So the day eventually comes when each of us needs help. The severe disappointments of life are beyond anybody's control. So verse, verse 47. When the nobleman, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and you can he has implored him. There are other versions that say he begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So what do we know to hear? He heard about Jesus. Aren't you glad you heard about him one day? My God up in heaven. You, he heard about Jesus and that Jesus had come to Galilee. He listened attentively to what he heard. He didn't turn a deaf ear to the message. He didn't think himself was too important to listen. He didn't consider the message to be foolish. He didn't mock the person sharing about Jesus. Whoever it was that originally shared with this man about Jesus, the, the nobleman didn't mock the Lord. He came to Jesus, facing one of the severe disasters of life. The man came to Jesus, and he was the only person he had ever heard about that might be able to help. Coming to Jesus required the man to pay a price. He had to make some sacrifice. First, he had had to leave the side of his dying son, knowing he'd be gone for many hours. Imagine the anxiety and the fear that his son might die while he was away. And the man would literally have to tear himself away from his son. And such an act shows how strongly he believed that Jesus could help him. Secondly, the man also had to travel almost a day's journey to reach him. Capernaum was about 20 miles from Cana. And imagine the concern and the apprehension gripping the father's heart every foot of the way, wondering if he should have left his son's side and the fact that he persevered, kept his eyes on the hope of Jesus, shows his genuine faith. And then thirdly, the man did not let his eyes position keep him from Jesus. Some folks that get so full of themselves that they feel they don't need any help. And spiritual help is that. Word of God says we ought not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. There's a many folks in the world today, in the political world, in the business world, you're thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think. When you come to Jesus, you've got to humble yourself. Oh, my God, he will speak to you. He will help you if you will humble yourself. And then that verse 47 says, he begged Jesus to help. He says, this little sister had a need. He hears about Jesus. He comes to Jesus. And the last step we see in this beginning faith is he had a persistent faith. Look there at verses 48 and 49. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, <laughs> You will by no means believe. The nobleman said to him, Sir, 
come down before my child Persistence. The desperate father begged Jesus to come to Cape Town and, and heal his son. But Jesus had an important lesson to teach the man. And our omniscient Lord knew what was in the man's heart. He knows that. Didn't we just read somewhere in one of our lessons? He knows all men. Oh, my God. He knows everybody. He knows where people are spiritually, where they stand with him. If Jesus had miraculous, miraculously healed the official son, he would believe. But Jesus wanted the man to realize that his word alone Somebody say his word, his word. Was it not? Belief in Jesus' word, his word was what was going to assure an answer to the request. Christ's power was at the nobleman's disposal if he would just believe it. Now listen, verse 48. Was not a rebuke of this nobleman. Rather, it was our Lord's lament of the spiritual condition of all the people in general, both in Judea and Galilee. For many believe that seeing is believing, and that's just the way it is in this world today. Folks want to be able to see it first, and then they'll believe. That's not happening with God. Oh, my God. He that cometh to him must first believe that he is God. And that in him he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. My God, you've got to love him first. Go to him first and watch him work in your life. Oh, so the nobleman believed that Jesus could heal his son, but he made two mistakes in his thinking. He made the mistake that Jesus had to go to Capernaum to save the lad, and that if the boy died meanwhile, it was too late. In verse 48, that word you is plural. Jesus was not only addressing the man, but the crowd too. He wanted the crowd to get the message as well. And we also need to know here that people are no different today. They might say they believe, but until they experience some sign, some wonder, some healing for themselves, do they really believe? Everybody's looking for signs and wonders. But we can't get caught up in that, because we don't get caught up in this Word. When we get caught up in the Word of God, God will come and do for you what needs to be done. He'll give you wisdom. He'll give you guidance. He'll give you instruction what to do. And then that verse 49, the nobleman said to him, Sir, come, come down before my child dies. The, no, the man was in no position to argue, not even to think through what Jesus had just said. He was desperate. A severe crisis had descended upon his family. And the lessons from these verses are crucial for us today. First, we need to grasp the truth that the Lord responds to faith. He responds to faith. And second, we need to persist in prayer until the Lord answers. The man was helped because he persisted. Persistence was absolutely necessary in securing the Lord's comfort. So then, now, in verse 50, Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your son lives. So the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. So the man is saying, come, come, come down, come, Lord Jesus. And Jesus said to him, go. <laughs> go, go your way. My God, go your way. The third stage of faith is a trusting obedience. Obedience and working faith. When Jesus gave the official his word, the man believed him without actually seeing that his son had been healed. His faith was proven by his obedience to the Lord's command to go back to Capernaum. And the promise was 
your need is not safe. So Jesus' response to the man's persistent faith was joyful. The Lord charged him to go back to Capernaum. Then Christ made the desperate father a powerful, assuring promise his son would live and not die. The man believed the word of God, the word that came from the master, and he obeyed the Lord's command to go his way. His belief demonstrates the instantaneous faith and action. He believed immediately, and he turned immediately. After the Lord told him to go, he could have still said, But come, but come, I need you to come. And the Lord is saying to each of us, Go and believe. Go and believe my word. He believed the Lord's love, compassion, and concern. He believed the Lord's knowledge. He believed the Lord's power. He believed the Lord's faithfulness to his word. The man could easily have acted like so many when they need to, when they need to go to God. Your word is not good enough. My son is not healed. He's there in Capernaum and far away. No place close to him. I need you to come. But oh, look there at verse 51 and 52. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. Then he inquired of them the hour when he got better. And they said to him, the seventh hour, the fever left The fourth stage of faith is a confirmed faith. As the man was on his way home, his servants met him to tell him that his son was alive and well. He was in the act of obeying Christ when he received the glorious news that his prayer had been answered. So a crisis comes in verse 46. Then humility in verse 47. A request in verse 47. In verse 48 and 49. Obedience in verse 50. A confirmation there in verses 50 to 50, 51 to 52, and then 53 to 54 says. So the Father knew that it was at the same time in which Jesus said to them, your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. This again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. So here we see the final is a witness of faith. Or you might even call it a contagious faith. My God, when, when God does something for you and through you and to you and in you, you'll do what they sang today. You'll go tell that. My God, hallelujah. When Jesus does something for you, you'll lift him up. You'll glorify him. You'll exalt him. You'll magnify him. And I want to add at this point, the Word of God gives us glorious stories. Every prayer not every prayer for help is answered in the same way as this story. Because many have died whom you prayed for and sought for. But the ultimate healing is when we step into the presence of all mighty God. What the Word of God gives us that as long as we live in these houses of faith, we do what the Word tells us to do. So 
that we can experience what we need to be able to experience to have success in this life as we walk with Almighty God. And as He gives us the Word of God, always gives us the principles to follow, the stages to follow, the stages of growth. We are always in a stage of growth. And it's a glorious story with many applications, and we've got to learn this, that all the roads of human experience will ultimately lead to Jesus. It'll lead to Him. When we find Him, all will be well. And you will have grown to the place that whatever God chooses to act upon His Word, He's sovereign in the end. And He's going to do what God wants to do best in our lives. But we always put Him first. Follow His Word. To ask and it shall be given. To seek and we would find. To knock and the door will be opened. But while you are growing in faith, you are growing in maturity. You are growing in strength. You are growing to the place where you are recognized that I know He's a God of love. And however He chooses to answer my prayer, I'm going to say, Yes, Lord. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. And that's the way we have to grow through faith. We grow and we mature. We grow and we mature. And sometimes it looks as if the Lord has broken your heart. But God knows the end from the beginning of every situation, every life, every heartache, every test, every trial. But as we trust Him and look to Him and depend upon Him, God will move by His Spirit on your life, on your situations, on your heart, and you will come to a place of where you will be strong and in the power of His might, and you will come to know and to trust Him and to believe Him and to act upon what this Word tells you. Not what the prophet says, not what the Pope says, not what any man says, but what the Word of God says. What God, what God says in His Word, and you've got to be careful for some of these denominations, because they're not teaching the Word of God. They want to be used as the individual that speaks to God for themselves, as if they are the only ones who hear from God. And they don't teach, they don't teach no Bible. I'm going to tell it like it is. Some of these denominations, they don't teach no Bible. You, you, don't, you don't hear about no Bible, Bible classes in some denominations. They're not teaching people how to grow, how to be mature and strong in the things of the Lord. They expect you to go behind some closed doors and, and repent of your sins and as if that is the one. Jesus is our intercessor. Jesus is our intercessor. He is the one that we go to. You don't have to come into my office and confess your sins. You don't have to come to me and tell me what you've done. You need to go before the Lord. Go before the Lord and confess your sins to Him.
when you stand before the Lord, Nobody, not preachers, not pope, not apostles, not men, not angels, nobody but you. And when you stand before him to give an account of the things that have been done in this place, all he wants to see is the blood. That's the blood. Wash your sins away. He was our sacrifice. He was the one who paid the price so that you and I might have eternal life. He was the one who endured the cross that you and I might have life abundant and the life we can have. Oh, I wish I could make it any cleaner to you. Know him, know him, know him. Know him for your thoughts. Know him. Know him for your thoughts. When you come to that dying day and the doctors have done all that they can do for you, and you're in that hospital room by yourself, know him for your That he will be able to say, Well done. How many of you are looking for a well done? Stand on your feet. Well done. My God, faithful, faithful. That's what God wants us to be faithful people. I go on him. Confidence in him. Trust in him. Life is filled with God in Christ Jesus. You're here today. You don't know him. You haven't accepted him. You haven't received him. You haven't made Christ your story. Come on, let's step out to the heart. Receive him today. He's able to give you a kind of life. He's able to take the most miserable individuals and bring them into a life of joy. Bring them into a life of peace. Bring them into a life of hope. He's able to take the love of and lift that individual up out of the mockery of the and establish the God that you might come to a state of generation. Oh, come to him today. Come to him. Come to him. Wherever you are, whatever you've done, you need forgiveness. Come. Come to this altar. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and here's what I'll do for you. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. You're not having no rest in this world. With everything that's going on in this world, the individual without Christ is the one that you have any peace at all. Wars and rumors of war, sicknesses and diseases, and killings and murders. It's a wonder if you didn't have Jesus that you haven't lost your mind. I'll keep you in perfect peace. You keep your mind in harmony. If you know him today, lift those hands. Lift those hands in prayer. Oh, lift those hands in praise. If you know him, if your faith is in him, if you know him beyond the Oh, 